So we typically in colors, the Center for Online Learning Research and Service at the University of Illinois Springfield, provide a web-based presentation and I've provided you with a short URL. And uh, Emily, would you put that in the chat box, please, so that everybody can have access to that link. My name is Vicki Cook. I am the Executive Director for Online Professional and Engaged Learning at the University of Illinois Springfield. And along with my co uh, Colors colleagues, we provide faculty development, not only to the faculty and staff at UIS, but across the country to a number of different organizations, to a group of uh, colleges and universities that invite us in to provide faculty development. And um, we really appreciate our opportunity to work with faculty across the country. And so we bring not only the information that we've gained through experience and study at UIS, but also we bring um, all of the information that we, have, that we have gathered from others across the country in Canada and in Mexico. So let's get started here. I have included a video. I'm not going to play it for you because everyone's bandwidth is different. But I'd like to encourage you to listen to Dr. Jenny Heyman, who is with Cambrian College in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And they have provided uh, a, a really good overview of high flex options. And so if you get the opportunity, if you take time to review this video, I think you'll find that it's very worthwhile. But let's start with talking about high flex or mode neutral learning. And we'll just, we'll just start out with uh, talking about um, how Educause has defined this particular learning model and how they have looked at the research that goes along with this model. So what is it? So HyFlex is a, a conceptual framework. It is a way to think about building your courses. It really talks about course design. So how are you going to provide for your students opportunities to think differently about the content of your course? So whatever discipline that you may be teaching in, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in history, whether you are in education, perhaps you're teaching in a, um, in a career and technical field, HyFlex is a course design model that will work with just about any discipline area. And so we'll delve into how it works because that's really where the meat of this is. It really works in ways that will allow you to utilize the resources you already have on your campus to present your materials in different ways. It is a combination of um, the classroom experience and the online experience. So it's really that concept that allows you to do remote teaching in a way that is um, both accessible for you and your students. This type of learning is very different because it is typically cataloged officially as a face-to-face -face class. And typically it's, it's uh, called face-to-face -face because you also have to have a room assignment for the face-to-face -face components. It differs a little bit from blended or hybrid learning because of the way it's designed for the students. In blended learning, the faculty member makes the decision on when you are going to offer specific content or particular activities in a face-to-face -face mode and which will be in an online mode. However, with hybrid, with the high flex, it is all about the student's choice. The student moves seamlessly back and forth as they see fit 
between the online and the classroom. Now that could be done by date. Maybe the student works and has travel that they have to do, or they'll be, um, they'll be involved in a project and they won't be able to attend class face-to-face -face, and so they opt to do the online component that week. Maybe next, the next student will say, well, I, I already have a background in these things that you're teaching tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and do the online components where I really need your help is with the, the topics that we're going to cover next week. And I wanna be here so I can ask questions as they occur to me. So those are the two ways that students can decide. They can decide by date or they can decide by topic, but the student always makes the choice. And so that's really where this particular high flex model is very different from a typical blended format. So let's stop there and I'm going to ask you to in the chat box if you would add some information on what what burning question do you have so far about this whole idea of student choice. So Jennifer asks if it would be more work for the professor. Um, Jennifer, we are going to get there. If you'll hold on for a few minutes, we will get to that point because that is really a crucial consideration. And Muhammad wants to know what the role of the instructor will be. Muhammad, you are always in control of the content. What you are less in control of is how the student ingests that content how they take in that con content. And Beverly asks how you'd facilitate a discussion in both modes. We'll get to that too, Beverly, if you hold on to that thought for a few minutes. How would someone plan for an unknown number of students in class? That is always difficult, Heather. Really difficult because you never know for sure unless you ask students to tell you at the first of the week wh which class they will be in. Jennifer asks, what if students make the choice based on misinformation? That is always a possibility. And I'm gonna talk about which students do better at this than some other uh, student characteristics might lend themselves to. How does student engagement vary? We'll talk about that too, Jeffrey. And avoiding things like don't like or are not good at. Um, Jennifer, you're gonna have to unpack that one for me a little bit. What do you mean? I don't like or not good at that was part that was part two of my initial question so what if students make um, choices that are not the best for their learning but they are making choices to avoid things that they don't like or they're not they feel like they're not good at well let's unpack that student characteristic just a minute here then and start with that piece because that speaks to both your question and a couple of others that have been asked the students that do best at being enrolled in a class that is high flex are those students who are a little more mature, students who have been engaged in online learning in the past, and students who are a little more self-disciplined. So you can pretty much say that students who, are, who fit the Generation Z traditional student learning are not going to be the best candidates for this type of approach. It works better in graduate programs than in undergraduate programs, a lot because of the maturity of the students. It also is important for students to know what kind of readiness they might have for this type of a, of a class approach. So one of the things that we have at UIS that, um, and your institutions may have them as well, is we have an online readiness checklist. And in order for um, students to feel comfortable knowing if they're ready to take online work, we encourage them to use that. Emily, would you be able to post that link in the chat box for everyone, please? So the having that type of a checklist, whether it's specifically for high flex or whether it is for online, will help students think through this process. 
Um, Sister John asked, do you recommend this for developmental level students? Um, you know, really, Sister John, that would depend on the level of maturity of the student rather than their academic level. So if they are a mature student who is able to balance the uh, workload with their life load, then they could certainly do this type of an approach. If they are a less disciplined student or if they've been out of school a long time and they're gonna struggle with the technology, then it is not a good approach for those students. But thank you for that question. So who's doing it? Well, you know, um, it started in 2006 is when this was first rolled out. And um, you probably haven't heard a lot about it until recently because it was not very popular uh, for a number of reasons. And we'll try to get to some of those too. When you think about the options of, um, of doing the types of remote learning that we all had to do in the spring, this is suddenly seeming very uh, attractive to a number of institutions. So institutions that would never have considered it before, now all of a sudden faculty are thinking about perhaps this would be a good approach. And so right now, um, this is one of the hottest topics that's out there. And I don't know if any of you um, actually follow Phil Hill, who writes a blog every week. He did a great blog a few days ago on this very topic. And I've got it linked at the bottom of this presentation under resources. So you can go out and find his information. And um, I think that would be helpful for you too, as you think about, is this a viable option for me in the fall? So why is this particular mode significant? Well, you know, it's significant because it presents students with multiple pathways to be able to get to their learning. So it's, it's very important that um, students arrive within your classroom at varying levels, right? It's very important that whatever level they're at, they find a way to move forward to meet the goals of the course, to meet your learning outcomes, and that you're able to assess their learning. And so when you think about your course design and your structure, it's really critical that you be able to take them wherever they are and move them to that next level. Um, Jeffrey asked, what if these options are offered to undergrads? Well, certainly it can be, but thinking about that, Jeffrey, from the point that you are taking students at a number of different levels and maybe at the developmental level, it's going to be on, you know, the, the, burn, the, the brunt of all of this is going to be on your shoulders to figure out ways to make those learning outcomes available regardless of the modality that the student is taking. So um, a couple of other questions that were asked, can you track student attendance using this model? Sure, of course you can uh, uh, track student attendance inside your classroom when they're there. You can also have certain activities that are due and certain checkpoints that are in your online class that you would have them check in on. Um, so when you talk about student engagement, it's really important to work with an instructional designer on your campus or a learning technology specialist who can help you think through the student engagement on the online side as well as in your classroom so that they can come together. They may not look exactly the same. And that's really the challenge is because you may be doing some of your work that is only going to benefit your face-to-face -face students because that's the type of activity it is. And that doesn't, it doesn't mirror itself online. So what is an activity online that would get to that same learning outcome? And sometimes talking through that with another faculty member or with your instructional designers on your campus is really what you need to do if you tell them what you normally do in the classroom, what your learning outcome is, what your goal is for the day, they can help you design the right 
activities that will help you assess if students have met those same activities. It's really important to remember that what really drives all of this are your learning outcomes. Your learning outcomes should be well stated and measurable. The activities can be changed. The learning outcomes should be the very same regardless whether you're face-to-face -face or whether you're online. So downsides, this goes back to one of Jennifer's questions. This can be more work for the faculty member the first time through. It, um, because you do have to think about, as we just talked about, activities may not be exactly the same face-to-face -face as they are online. So when you're thinking about redesigning components of your course, in order to meet those learning outcomes, it may be a little more difficult the first time through. Now, those of you who have a face-to-face -face class and an online class of the very same content, then it becomes an easier thing to marry those two pieces together. But if you don't have the luxury of already having developed the online content, you will have to think that through and it has to be thought through for each class meeting, not just for some of the class meetings. So there is more work on the front end. The other thing is there are, um, there are several people who use a teaching style where they kind of go from week to week, they adjust things as they go, they kind of do things on the fly, and they wait to see how their students are interacting before they make decisions. You cannot use that approach with high flex or mode neutral. You really have to have well planned out lesson plans each week and work toward those. Now, can you make tweaks through the semester? Of course. If you find out that students are way past where you thought they were and you want to move forward faster, fine. And vice versa. If you need to add more information and back up and slow down, then you can do that. But that has to be done in both modalities. So thinking about that may be something that will be important to how you approach designing the class. The other component that you need to think about is that it requires a lot of organization on your part and a lot of facilitation. It's important to remember that when you have a class that part of the students are face-to-face -face and part of them are online, you still want those students to engage together. You want them to interact. And so it's critical that you set up discussion forums online and that your students, regardless whether they're in front of you tonight or whether they're online this evening, they're still interacting together. And then you bring those discussions back in to both components of your classes. Jennifer says, how do we continue to build a cohesive classroom culture when there's so much potential separation? And it's much what I'm just talking about now, Jennifer, is really thinking about the aspects of high flex in blending that communication model between the online and the face-to-face. -face. In most of the courses, students will come in and out of them and they don't typically choose a single modality. They will usually move back and forth. And when they do that, then it's important to think about that whole concept of student engagement, honestly using best practices for online classes that you use with the face-to-face -face students as well. And what challenges does HyFlex present to team projects? Jeffrey, just like the, the um, challenges that online students face with team projects, they, they may be at a distance. And quite frankly, this fall, many of your students may be at a distance. And so it's going to be very important that you provide them with some guidelines on how to find the time to work together. Maybe you schedule a Zoom session and you set up breakout rooms for each one of the teams to work for an hour so that the teams can work together to get their team projects off the ground or moving forward. It's important to, to think really clearly 
about all the organizational structure of your class before you ever set foot in the classroom or in your online course. So really that design process, back to what we said in the beginning, what is it? It's a course design that is surrounded by a conceptual framework. It is dependent on you as the instructor, you are the kind of the, the key piece that holds it all together. And it is critical that you have all of the pieces mapped out so that students aren't lost in the shuffle of how things are happening. Um, let's see, what are, let's see, what, where is it going? So I think the, what we'll see over the next, over the next semester for sure, if not the next year, is that HyFlex is going to really skyrocket. Um, I noticed that some of the literature now is calling it flex blend. So that's another term that as you're reading, um, you may see. And I've included a number of different articles at the end of this presentation in uh, the resources area that you can explore this topic even further. But you will see that a lot of institutions are going to go with this model and a lot of faculty are considering how they can effectively utilize this model to assist their students, especially since there's so much unknown today. And implications for teaching and learning, I think we want to make sure that you remember that um, breaking down that boundary between the physical and the virtual boundary is very important. You're trying to eliminate that boundary in as many ways as possible. So if you are, if you are talking to your group and recording your face-to-face -face class, make sure you include and look at the screen where you're recording so that you can include those students who are not physically in the room. If you are not recording during your actual face-to-face -face class, but you're recording a lecture that you're going to post online, make sure that you're including information for both face-to-face -face and online students. Thinking about every component of your class and how you can be inclusive of all learners. Obviously, if you have a small class under 20, your inclusiveness will be a lot easier than if you're trying to use this model and you have 50 students or 100 students in a class. That will be a little more challenging and will require more planning on your part. Um, also, I think it's really important that you develop a team. You need a team, find other faculty on your campus who are using this that you can really create a community of practice with. I really think a community of practice is an excellent way to help faculty to continue to explore these different teaching strategies and come up with best practices for your institution. Also coordinate with students. You know, ask them what's working for you, what's not working for you, what do you wish was different, just on a regular basis. Just check in with your students throughout the semester, maybe every three weeks, every four weeks, and find out how things are going and adjust it as you need to do so. Make sure that you're talking with your IT support folks and that you have the support for not only yourself, but also for your students so that no one gets locked out of a class because of the technology. And then your learning technology support at UIS, that's our color Center for Online Learning Research and Service. Um, that group does a, a great job with reaching out to faculty across campus. Each of your campuses has some type of learning technology support and uh, being engaged with those folks is very important. There may be others. Um, you may have, especially if you're working with undergrads, you may need to work on um, building rapport with your Center for Academic Success. Maybe you'll need to have a connection with your library. Maybe you'll need to have a connection with your tutors. 
but whoever is on your campus that can help support the group of students that you're working with, they need to know that you're experimenting with a new strategy, with a new type of course design, and that you want their input and their partnership as well. All right, uh, let's take a look at the high flex as a design. So there's really four core values to the design of a high flex class. So let's kind of look into that. And Brian Beatty um, has done a really good job. He's just published this uh, book called A Closer Look at High Flex Design. It is a free ebook. I've included a link. Um, and I would suggest that you take a look at that if you aren't very familiar with this particular um, type of strategy. And I don't think anyone uh, was when we started the, uh, the presentation. So it's, it's a, great, uh, a great breakdown of everything that you need to think about before you get started. But the four core principles that he's identified are learner choice providing meaningful alternative participation modes, and then letting the students choose between participating by date or by topic. Equivalency, providing learning activities in all modes. We talked a little bit about that. It's really critical that students not have to give up being part of a particular learning outcome or meeting a particular learning outcome through their assessment because they weren't allowed to take part in an activity. For instance, if you have your students go out and interview someone in the field that you're working with, what difference does it make if you're sending them out from a face-to-face -face class or through an online class? However, you may have an activity in your face-to-face -face class that just does not work well in online. And there, again, get with your instructional design folks on your campus and help and let them help you think through what activity is equivalent to that. It doesn't have to be the same, it has to be equivalent. Reusability, this is really important for your workload. Um, use art artifacts from learning activities in both participation modes that can be used again and again and again as learning objects. For instance, even when we are working with faculty on their videos, we want to make sure that they don't use things like talking about, oh, it's a beautiful sunshiny day today. And by the time the student is watching that video, it's raining like cats and dogs. You don't want to use the term information. You don't want to say fall 2020. You want to make everything very generic. Some uh, people will tell you even to dress generically. Don't wear a turtleneck when your video may be shown in July. So think about how you can really take out as much information that is specific to a particular place and time and make it much more reusable. That will help with your workload down the road. <clears throat> and then we have accessibility. I'm not going to go into accessibility because my colleague Vance Martin is with us and he is going to talk about universal design in just a moment. And he'll talk about accessibility and equipping students to be able to access all of the materials, whether they're face-to-face -face or online. So there are three learning principles with high flex mode neutral learning. And we'll cover those very quickly. Um, changing the locus of control from an externally perceived entity to internal for the learner. You're really putting the learner in the driver's seat. The learner has to be very self-motivated they have to be able to read and write fairly well in order to be able to do this well on their own, unless you are going to connect them with your tutoring writing center and get them some help that they need. But the more help that they need when they're away from you, the more difficult it is for them to do this well. Self-motivation and self-discipline are key for students to be successful in this mode. Creating a convergence among the modes of delivery to one mode of learning 
is very important. It's not about the delivery. It doesn't matter whether we learn in a classroom or whether we learn online. It's how we are learning. So that mode of learning is what we want to get to. Whether that's through iterative processes, whether that's through a variety of different strategies, whether that's working through a number of different activities, but it's not about being in face-to-face -face or online. It's about utilizing the best of both to create learning and meeting those learning outcomes. And then student-generated learning that builds on self-determination. If you're not familiar with the terminology hudagogy, hudagogy is, um, so you have pedagogy, the art and science of learning. You have andragogy, which is learning as an adult. And hudagogy is self-determined learning. And what you want to get to is you want the students on that continuum moving from that very pedagogical, teacher-centered, teacher-oriented approach to becoming self-determined learners so that they can take not only the content of your course, but also the act of learning with them so they can continue to be lifelong learners. All right, I'm gonna turn over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Vance Martin, and he is going to talk about universal design for learning. Vance? Thank you, Vicki. <clears throat> so yes, I did have some technology issues. It's all working now. <laughs> So I, I think that this, this model uh, lends itself very well to the idea of uh, universal design. Uh, it also lends itself to the idea, as Vicki said, to consult with uh, instructional designers and educational technologists at your school to get a sense for what should be included in the class, because it takes a lot of uh, thought to think about things. Uh, I could say I taught for about 18 years and I will admit that in those first years we often uh, lean towards our strengths and so that means that many of us probably did really well in lectures or uh, certain groups or something which influenced you know our paths. So one of the things to think about uh, when you're thinking about universal design is that you're trying to design uh, the content for your class, whether the modality is online or on campus or some sort of hybrid uh, mix based on that, so that the teaching and learning products are usable by all people to the greatest extent possible and that you don't need afterwards any special changes or uh, adaptations or anything like that. And so that requires a lot of thought. So thinking about how can you create uh, materials for your course that will um, uh, speak to different types of students. And so I'm sure we all have different uh, backgrounds in how we think people learn and, and different types of learning styles. But I mean, at the, at the base level, I'm sure we've all heard of, you know, well, some people learn best by doing, some people do best by seeing, some people do best by hearing. Uh, so you need to think about at least those three things when you're designing the products. Uh, I'll give a quick example that, that several years ago, I took a refresher course on statistics and the entire course was online. And uh, I was told to read the textbook and read the notes online. Um, that did not work well for me uh, for a math class because I needed to hear certain things in statistics uh, to understand things. So if we were going to pick on the statistics class, uh, thinking about where are the, the stopping points that we know that students have had in the past, how can we help them? Can we make uh, short videos that will help them overcome these, these stopping points? Uh, if we're using videos, should we have some sort of, of uh, write-up on, you know, our general thoughts on why we included that video? Uh, but thinking about certain students are going to want to learn different ways, so including these different types of materials within our class so that students have options themselves. Uh, and letting them know that, that uh, if you read this lecture, this is about the same content as is going to be in this video. Uh, 
if you're going to watch this video, it's the same uh, content that's going to be in this PowerPoint. Uh, as Vicki said, with, with projects, the equivalency of projects, also allowing students to have choices in how they can still reach the same learning goals within your class, but potentially show that in different ways. So uh, I taught history for most of my career, and uh, I used to offer several different options uh, in those classes. One involved allowing students to, to journal playing historical based video games. Uh, one allowed students to recreate objects as they were in the past. One allowed them to read period novels to, to pull the history out of those novels. So different students chose those because it spoke to them initially. So thinking about how can you uh, incorporate these things on campus, online, uh, and also to appeal to different types of learning styles. Um, so universal design also incorporates the ideas of accessibility. So uh, about 25% of the population has some form of a disability, whether that is learning, cognitive, or physical. Uh, typically when we're thinking about uh, making materials accessible for people, we often uh, focus on the two main areas of people who are blind or people who are deaf. So that means that if we are, are dealing with uh, thinking about people who are deaf for our videos, that means we need to, this is legally, but also best learning theory as well, provide captions uh, for the videos, 99% uh, accurate captions, um, as well as transcripts, uh, which are very easy to make once you have the captions to, to produce, just, just has the text of that video. Um, there's a, a study about four years ago now out in Oregon where they found that while only about 10% of students uh, within the study of five or 6,000 students needed to use captions, about 85% of the students were using the captions. So I think that we've all kind of gotten used to uh, watching Facebook videos on our phones or something and, and reading the captions because maybe, maybe our office, uh, next person in the office next to us doesn't want to hear that. Um, so think about captions. Similarly, and this one I think is probably tougher sometimes for people, uh, if somebody is blind, thinking about how can you make those materials accessible for them. So people who are blind typically use a screen reader. Uh, people with some uh, learning and cognitive disabilities also use screen readers. And so a screen reader is a piece of software that reads the content on the screen, but only if it had been made in an accessible manner. So typically stuff that is, is on a website if done well, can be made very accessible. Uh, stuff that is in a Word file can be very accessible. One of the defaults though that we often revert to is uh, producing stuff as a PDF, whether it's a, a scan of a book chapter, uh, a website, something like that. Uh, PDFs are highly problematic, not only for people who are using screen readers because they're blind, but also for students who have dyslexia and certain other uh, cognitive uh, impairments. So we need to think about these things. So as we look at the, the, um, this chart from, it's from CAST, I believe, is that it is linked in the, uh, in the, uh, in the presentation. This is really uh, thinking about what is the why of learning, uh, what is the what of learning, and what is the how of learning. So they're really saying from the, the top down, you're trying to get to these bottom levels where because you've put all the forethought into designing quality products uh, with varied options for your students, allowing them their own pathways, that they are going to become self-regulated students, similar to what Vicki was talking about with the self-determination, uh, comprehending the information that you're trying to get across. Because I think that, that any of us who are instructors uh, cherish those times when students really get it uh, so that we can engage in the, in the meat of our subject matter rather than, you know, the, the uh, you know, well, this is how you cite things and this is how you, you know, all the, the stuff that builds up to that, uh, as well as, as uh, helping students actually um, 
get the information uh, so that they can become, uh, you know, their own learners. And so this kind of roadmap uh, designed by CAST over, over many years, uh, I think is, is very helpful. So, I mean, if this is your first time hearing about UDL, or this is your first time hearing about HyFlex as you're thinking about that, you might only be starting at that top level. It may take several semesters to get down to this bottom level, but several iterations uh, of your course can actually get to uh, these levels to help the students uh, take and learn from a class that meets their needs, that uh, has had a lot of thought which went into it. I'd also um, add to that and, and ask Vance this question. Um, if you are recording your lecture inside the classroom that you want to then take and post on your, uh, inside your learning management system for those students who are online, Vance, what type of um, captioning needs to be done for that type of a video? And, and how long should faculty plan to for that to take in order to upload that into their into their online portion of their class so the actual captioning and everything mm -hmm. so so typically um it takes about three times the final runtime of a video in order to caption it properly uh, we have a lot of great tools when i was a grad student <clears throat> many years ago uh we used to have to hand caption stuff. So literally listen to the video, type it out, and then sync it with the video at a later point. Uh, we have wonderful artificial intelligence engines in YouTube, for instance, which will get about 93% of, of uh, accuracy on a video. And so I have a team of student workers. We use YouTube uh, to do the uh, captions. We let it do that auto captioning, then the students go through and do the corrections. It takes about three minutes per one minute of video. Um, I also find that with faculty, if they are fixing their own captions, it takes about that same amount of time as they may be less familiar with the technology and how to use it, but they know what they said, or they've taught this section so many times uh, that they can catch the errors immediately. Um, in the captions, but it's still gonna take, uh, a one hour video is gonna take you three hours of time. And so my, my recommendation in instances like that is that, that um, we know from data that people are going to watch about two minutes and three seconds of a video. Uh, over the years, I've kind of given this rule of thumb that if we're, if we're thinking of 100, 200, 300 level classes, um, you can add two minutes per hundred level, but that still maxes out at about 10 minutes. Uh, a 10 minute video isn't too bad to caption, it takes about a half hour. But um, when we're posting these types of videos, maybe editing down uh, some of the segments of class, you know, the really great discussion that, that Bobby or Susan brought up. Um, because while we all feel that we're wonderful uh, presenters sometimes, uh, oftentimes our students may tell us the, the, uh, the stark truth. And honestly, if the, your great part wasn't until um, 45 minutes into the recording, they'll never get there to hear it. So, um, so as Van suggested, editing those videos down or chunking them into 10 minute chunks is another way to get to that. And so um, not everybody is great at video editing. I am not. Vance and, em and Emily, who are with us today, both are very good at it. It takes me longer than the three minutes per one minute to get it done, um, probably because I spend too much time on the editing component of it and trying to bring it down into that three to seven minute video clip approach so that I will hopefully get people to actually listen to what it is I want them to listen to when I'm doing lectures for a class. Vance, any other final words before we move on to the next section? I think those are the other things. If people want to contact me, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Yeah, you can put them in the chat box or you can email Vance. Um, and I will add Vance's uh, contact information as well. Um, Vance, you could put your contact information in the chat 
box to see if they want to see it. Sure. So one of the things that we want to make sure that we leave you with before we um, sign off today is a couple of um, actual course calendars so you can kind of see what this format would look like. So this is one that Emily created some time ago when she and I did a presentation um, at the Midwest Association of um, Graduate uh, Studies. And so this particular weekly calendar gives some idea of what a student would have to do for each of their particular lessons, depending on whether they were online or on campus. And so you see there, there are, are uh, entries that show about group work and case study work and homework help and, and what's going to happen at the on-class meeting or on-campus class meeting. Then there's also the discussion questions in the, in the discussion boards. At that time, we used Blackboard. And um, so you have those discussion questions that all students will talk into. So those are the kinds of things that you would have in a weekly calendar. Now, Phil Hill, who I told you had just done a great blog post on this, he put together a, a few sample class plans that I thought were worth bringing in. Now, this one is a 50 minute class plan and it talks about which part are synchronous in person, synchronous online and asynchronous online. And you can see where they go across all three or they're specific to that particular mode. And so I thought he did a very nice job of really breaking it down to what specifically would be the instructor's role and what specifically would be the student's role in these particular activities. He also provided a link to Creative Commons and that Creative Commons link has a number of different class plans in varying timeframes that you could utilize to help you think about your own class. One of the things that is important is the technology. So technologies have to be simple and flexible. You want the normal LMS that you use on campus in your college for anything else. You want to keep everything as simple as possible. You want to reduce the number of email type functions that are happening through communication. Try to keep all of your communication inside your LMS. It's much easier for you to stay organized and your students to stay organized if there's one specific place where you can both go to interact and communicate. Use web conferencing and record your web conferences. You may have to, as Emily Vance and I all did, create a, a um, calendar item that pops up and reminds you to record because it is easy to start and then you're in 10 minutes or so and then you remember to record. Um, Emily, would you copy that Creative Commons link and add it to chat, please? Sure, Richard, we'll do that. Um, the, using the discussion board, it's really critical. That discussion board takes the place of your in-class discussions in many ways. That's what's leveling the playing field is having the opportunity to have everyone involved in those discussions. When you're doing discussion boards, um, it's, it's really important to remember best practices for online discussions. Discussion boards should be built on Socratic questioning. Your, your question should never be a simple yes and no. You can use some of the strategies like um, uh, point counterpoint, where you assign so many students in the class, they have to argue a particular point, and then the other students in the class have to argue a counterpoint. Whether they believe in it or not is not the point that you're trying to get to. The point you're getting to is that they can read literature, they can um, take that literature and then build an actual argument um, advocating for or against a particular stance. Um, you can do uh, a multitude of different questions. You can, have, you can have starter questions. You always want to try to build the learning. So scaffold 
the way that you're doing your discussions. Those are all very good activities for an online classroom that also play into the high flex modality. When you are talking in, in, and having a class discussion in your face-to-face -face class, people often popcorn off of each other. And you know, someone will say this thing and that will lead to two more people thinking about it a different way. You want to get to those same types of engaging conversations online. Now remember people are doing this all the time in Facebook, um, in at all types of social media platforms. They're out there and they're reacting to what someone else is saying. You have to decide do you want that type of a reaction or do you want a reasoned response based on literature? And if you want it based on literature, consider having some citation as part of what you are doing, especially if this is at a graduate level. Even for upper division undergraduate level, citations are a good idea to help students keep on track with academic thinking as they're moving through the discussion forum. Using group tools in LMS for collaborative research, for case studies, breakout rooms in your web conferencing, and using quizzing tools for objective self-assessment. Um, quizzing tools are great or using some type of a journaling feature helps students self-assess where they are, what they're doing, how they're learning. And remember, when you want them to be self-determined learners, it's important that you build self-assessment into the activities throughout the semester. So registration and fees, it's important that you work with your registrar's office to make sure that everything is as it should be in the classification system. But as I mentioned earlier, typically these classes are um, put into your system as a, a, an on-campus class. They're typically not considered online, mostly because you have to have a room assigned for the on-campus components. I wanted to bring in this self-directed professional development piece a little bit. This is something that you can explore more fully at your convenience. Um, and it talks about learning in a new age. And how do people today learn? Uh, if you haven't read some of the material about being a 60-year learner or 100-year learner, there's a lot of material out there. And so teaching your students how to become that 60-year learner is very important and is part of what's embedded in a high flex or mode neutral or um, what's the new term? Um, I just said it a while ago. Blend, flex blended, I think is what it is. Um, those, that modality, which is all referring to the same approach, it's really important that they are self-determined. So under the learn more section, I have included multiple links and there are many more. You can do a quick Google search and find a lot of information about this high flex mode of teaching. So with that, I'm going to take a breath and ask you in the chat if you have any final questions or any thoughts that you'd like to share with the group as we wrap up. You're welcome. I'm glad that uh, so many of you were able to come today. Thanks. Thanks, Sherry. If there's anything that we can do to assist you in um, thinking about this, or you just want to bounce a question off of someone, um, we have, uh, we'll be glad to assist you. You can email us at colors and you can email me directly and we'll be glad to respond in any way that we can. Thank you so much for attending today.